Hi, and welcome to this episode of Brainy Moms. I'm Dr. Amy Moore here with my co-host, Terry Miller, coming to you today from a beautiful, sunny and hot Colorado Springs, Colorado. Our guest today is health and life coach, Susan Scullin. Susan gave birth to her son, Teddy, in November 2013, and within a month, she knew she wasn't herself. With ongoing sleep issues, breastfeeding issues that led to mastitis and surgery, and being told that her baby wouldn't survive, it was at the six-month mark where Susan was in a big black hole, and she knew that things had to change. She tuned into her intuition, believed it was possible to create a life she loved, and she went to work doing exactly that. She's here today to talk to us about a very important topic, enjoying life after postpartum or postnatal depression. Welcome, Susan. So glad to have you here. Thank you, Terry. It's great to be here. Thank you, Amy. I'm really excited for this conversation today. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you have a story and a message, I think, that's going to really resonate with our listeners. I think it's um, a big issue, something that a lot of moms struggle with. And I want to hear your story. And I want you to start off, tell everyone, where are you today? Where are you coming from? (laughs) I'm coming from Barham Heads in Queensland, Australia. So up until 10 months ago, I actually lived lived in Canberra, which is the capital of Australia. Most people don't know that. It's south of Sydney. And um, my husband and I were looking to move to the coast. And he's he said to me, we know with COVID happening and everything, he goes, the bottom's going to fall out of the property market. We're not going to be able to afford to move, blah, blah, blah. We're going to be stuck here forever. Like, you know, really fatalistic kind of language. And I just said to him, what's one thing that we could do to move towards our dream of living by the coast. And within a week, we had a phone call from his brother telling him that he was buying a property close to where we ended up buying. And Chris said to him, if you don't buy it, I'm going to buy it. And the rest is history. Everything just kind of fell into place. And and now we're in Queensland and we love it. And it's like sunshine all year round, which is really beautiful. Uh, So So before we, before we talk about your story, I do have to ask about the sharks. So are they as prolific (laughs) and scary as we hear they are on the coast of Australia? Well, they, you know, they can be in certain areas. So there's certain areas of Australia that you potentially don't swim in. Western Australia is one of those areas. Um, And there's, again, it's particularly localised. So it's not everywhere around Australia. Like you don't look at a map and, you know, shark central. Um, Where we live, Fraser Island has a shark area on the end of Fraser Island. So if you want to go diving and be around sharks, great. But in terms of swimming, you're generally you're fine. It's not so bad. There are certain times of the year that perhaps you, you know, don't want to go out um, into certain areas. But general, I have I've never seen one, and admittedly, I don't go under the water and look for them as well. But I've <laughs> never been in, in an area where I've had a shark um, a shark scare. Okay. Well, thank you. So you'd be safe for us. No yeah. worries. <laughs> That's reassuring. Safe, it's, it's spiders and snakes and stuff like that as well. Where we've lived, where we moved to, um, my nephew was staying here for a couple of months and he was telling us how he found brown snakes and that there were baby brown snakes, you know, across the property. We're on a half acre block. And sorry, I'm just pointing as I, as I look out the window kind of thing. And uh-huh. He had killed a couple of them at maybe about four. And I was just like, I haven't seen one in 10 months. Like I've been here that long and maybe I'm not looking for them, but I just haven't seen one. And so it's, it's okay. We're not infested with sharks and snakes and spiders. <laughs> okay. We do get to breathe and do other things as well. That's awesome. So this is a question. I'm an indoor girl. And so um, those things would influence whether or not I would want to come to your area of the world and visit. And so, That's so funny. Uh, I'm not, I'm not super adventurous outside. Yeah. Well, I think you're fairly safe then. You can just come and see the beautiful parts of Australia and you'll be okay. Sounds great. Okay. So back to so, you, let's hear your story. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I've always been into health and wellness. So that's probably, um, you know, back when I was growing up and all that sort of stuff, I was always into health and wellness, but it was just this sort of yo-yo ride that I would be on because I played netball, which is a sport here. The Commonwealth countries typically play it. It's like basketball. And so I would play that through the winter and then through the summer, I'd generally have some downtime and, and my health, you know, would be good through the winter and then not so great through the summer, that kind of stuff. But 
what happened was um, in 2013, I had Teddy, we had gone through three rounds of IVF to get him. Um, so as a doctor said, he was a special baby. And then um, we had some complications through the pregnancy and I ended up going through the fetal medicine unit here in um, or in Canberra at the time. So for higher risk pregnancies, I was 38, if I remember correctly. Yes, I was 38. Um, and um, because he had, we had gone through IVF, they recommended we go through the fetal medicine unit. And that was an amazing experience. Um, I had placenta previa. And so a low lying placenta. So I had to have a cesarean again, went through pretty much unscathed through that process. I, I didn't do a lot of research, which was probably my downs, one of my downsides. Um, but at the same time, I knew that I was, had great care, which was great. Um, but within a month, as per what we talked about earlier, um, you know, things weren't going so well. Teddy wasn't feeding well. He was feeding an hour on an hour off. And for a person that loves 10 hours worth of sleep, I always knew it was going to be a challenge, but it was like next level kind of challenge. And um, I was just not myself pretty much like within that month. And we had uh, like in Australia have a, a, a nurse, you know, community nurse come in and see you. And she gave me this form to tick off. And I knew that if I ticked one way, they would say I had postnatal depression. And if I ticked the other way that she would walk out the door and I chose to tick the way for her to walk out the door. Um, to try and I you know I had these stories that I had to figure this out that there was it should be easy um, you know that other people have done it before me like my son my my husband already had three boys so I was like well he kind of knows what it's like to raise a child my mum had five children she knows what it's like to raise a child so I was constantly looking outside of myself for the answers and thinking that things would just figure themselves out well they didn't and so um, because of the breastfeeding issues being an hour on, hour off, I would seek support from the community nurses and they suggested that I do a breast pump and see what came through. Well, nothing came through. And that was one of the most excruciating another hour of my life sitting there with this thing stuck on my, on my breast. And um, I got mastitis out of that. I didn't know what mastitis was. Um, and so I was just like, oh, it just feels warm, feels odd. I was Googling things and um, it was over the Christmas break. So my doctor was away at the time or the, the surgery was shut down. So I had to go to another doctor. They were really good. They gave me antibiotics, said, yes, it's mastitis, but go back to your doctor if, you know, challenges continue. And things did continue. So I went back to my doctor. She suggested that I go and have the milk that was building up inside of my breast excised through ultrasound. So I went and did that. And, you know, you're doing this in amongst trying to breastfeed a child, get do it on sleep patterns with the child, like keep him sleeping at the right times you know, trying to do some sort of movement for yourself after having a cesarean. I couldn't do a lot of movement, but just trying to look after myself in that space as well. And so fitting in any sort of extra activity was always going to be more challenging. Anyway, so I went to this person, uh, a specialist to have the milk excised um, and I was lying on his table and I was half naked, babies in a cradle and he just said to me, you're going, you're killing your baby. You're going to kill your baby. Um, and he came from a perspective of, you know, you're on antibiotics and that's not healthy for a child. And I knew intellectually that that wasn't correct, but there was just, I just hadn't found my voice at that time. And I knew that I needed him to get the milk out of my breast. So the pain in that site could, you know, lessen. I got that done and I just got out of there and I never went back. Um, and I went and saw my doctor and she reassured me that everything was fine. Teddy was going to be fine, even though I was on the antibiotics to try and sort out the mastitis. So that was, you know, one of the things that sort of really challenged me for mentally and my inner critic had gotten really loud um, and continued to be loud over the period, um, I guess over a, sort of a 12 month period, but what the next sort of thing that happened was um, I had somebody really close to me coming into my house unannounced. They would just turn up at my door and she would say the same thing to me um, that I was going to be taking my child's life. And the reason that, that she was saying it was because I'm, I would get up, I would be breastfeeding at the time generally that they turned up. I'm not a person to get my boobs out to the world. And so I would put a cloth over him, covering myself, covering him. He was safe. 
he could breathe um, and I would open the door to, to this person. And on the third time I went, that's enough. It's not appropriate. And I was able to, I had to explain to her why I was doing what I was doing. Um, and she never mentioned it to me again. Uh, I don't care if she mentioned it to anybody else, but I just kind of mention it because it actually has a massive effect on somebody. And, and like, it's something that I still talk about today. The fact that I bring it up actually had a big impact on me and being a new mum, being a first time mum, being perhaps an older mum, I, I really didn't know what I was doing. And I'm not sure, you know, Terry, you've got, you know, nine children. And as you would know, each child is different. So even coming into a second, third, fourth, fifth child, it's always going to be a different experience. So that was really challenging for me because that was somebody that I would have thought had my back and would, would have been able to support me. But, you know, the lessons are for myself was that I needed to listen to my own intuition. I needed to find my voice and I needed to step forward. On top of that, the mastitis got worse. Um, we had our wedding anniversary and Chris and I went out for dinner. My sister beautifully looked after Teddy and I had given her two bottles to, to feed Teddy with, um, but we, we missed the second feed. And so that then led on to Teddy actually sleeping through the night for the first time ever. Of course, my breasts were a mess by the next morning. You know, so my sister had done all the right things. Teddy was happy. I was physically just not coping. Um, and then, so within a couple of days, I was back at the hospital. The first time that I had the milk excise, they took out 50 mils. This time they took out 160 mils. And so that's the size of a small Coke bottle that's, you know, within my breast. So it's, it was just massive and it was painful and it wasn't great. And I even had um, doctors at the hospital who had come in to, and brought the students in to have a look at me and this site and, and I, I, you know, I'm open for learning, but I'm also open to how quickly can we get this done? And, you know, that wasn't happening particularly fast because I went in on a, on a public holiday Monday and I ended up, um, wasn't till after lunch on the Tuesday that they were able to actually take the milk out. And it was very painful. Um, and again, I felt like I had a student taking out that milk. So their hand was wobbly and I'm, I was in tears. It was, <laughs> it was not fun. Um, that then led me to going to have, to have surgery so I was referred to a doctor uh, or specialist and again you know another really smart person but I said to him I our appointment I feel like the issue is coming from the inside out often with mastitis it's a bug on the skin on the outside coming in and he said you don't know what you're talking about anyway we went through surgery um, everything went really well and he came to me um, in recovery room and said you were right so it's kind of that whole anchoring back into what do we know? What do I know as a person about my own body and being able to speak my truth, even in the midst of other people not being able to, um, you know, support me as I needed the support at that point in time. So I felt like I was constantly in this kind of fight and battle. And because of the surgery on my breast, I had to have my breast packed um, so the wound was left open and it had to be packed every day for six weeks. And so initially that was um, a nurse coming in to see me. So again, coordinating around times and things like that. And then my husband would do it for me before he left for work every day. Um, so, you know, like it's just the management of all these extra things on top of trying to just function as a human being um, and then trying to be a new mum, doing all of the, you know, breastfeeding and changing nappies and, um, you know, making dinner and cleaning the house and washing and everything else. And then trying to look after your mental health on top of that it was just like this cascading um, waterfall effectively for me. And so it wasn't till the May that I, I went to get milk. I went down to the shops to get milk. I had to drop into my brother's on the way. And I just, i literally fell apart on his couch he was amazing um, and really supported me. And he just sort of said, you know, this is a point in time. This will not be your forever and it's okay. And um, I've got home that like two hours later, I turned back up at home without the milk, expecting for my husband to kind of go, ah, where's the milk? We need the milk, but he didn't. And he was really great. And he just held space for me. And I just said, I just need some time. And I just went out the backyard later that afternoon. Um, I, was in, <laughs> I was in our spa, which was great, but <clears throat> you know, not everybody has a spa and I was just kind of, it's like this oxymoron of, I have all these privileges yet I want none, none of them. 
And I knew at that point that I really hated my life, yet I had created it. And so what did I, what did I want to create next? Um, you know, I played through all the scenarios of potentially taking my own life and, and what would that look like? Did I want to be here on this earth? Did I want to be a mum? Did I want to be a mum and a wife? Did I even want to live in this house? And, and just sort of played out all of that sort of stuff. But at some, on some level, I knew that things could be different and perhaps it was just looking to those other women who were around me who were doing things differently and went, okay, what would be the first thing that I would do? And, you know, being kind to myself was probably that first thing is just going, okay, this is a shit situation, but we can move forward from here. I know it's going to be tough. I know the work's going to be tough, but, you, you know, you have an inner strength somewhere there. You've gotten yourself to this point. You've survived this long. How can we move forward from here? And that was sort of me moving into the next stage of, figuring out who I was and, and how I wanted to move forward and, you know, learning to trust my intuition and just eating well, cleaning up exercise, all of those sorts of things, doing the basics really well to then be able to find, um, you know, take a path forward from there. My goodness, you went through it. Oh my goodness. So hard. Yeah. It was I mean, really just, hard. yeah. I mean, just listening to your story. I mean, remembering, my own experiences that were so tough, but obviously nothing like what you had to deal with. That's, oh my goodness. And you, I think that's where you're coming from is that you were able to turn things around. Mm. And is that, is that what I'm hearing you say is that after all of that, you were still able to turn things around. Yeah, and I shared with you at the start of this call that we moved to Queensland 12 months ago and I remember standing in the house before we had sold it um, in, our, in our home in Canberra and I thought, you know, six years ago I stood in this same home not wanting any of it. I didn't want my life. I didn't like, you know, didn't know whether I was going to be in the home or with a husband or the, you know, have my child. I didn't know if I, any of that was even possible to love and here I stand six years later I love my life. I love my husband. I love my son. All same environment, like nothing had changed. The only thing that had changed was me. And so I had gone in and then done all the inner work to be able to create the life that I actually loved. And now we've been able to grow that into something so much more and so much more beautiful than I could have ever imagined. Wow. So I want to talk about the timeline from sure. when you were in your spa at rock bottom, right? Yep. Going through those scenarios that included possibly taking your own life to the turnaround. How long did it take you to get from being rock bottom to saying, no, I'm going to take my life back and then start that first step? I'm a pretty fast mover. So my first step was the next day. And the first step that I can like recall, exercise is really easy for me to kind of like bring into my life. So there was a couple of non-negotiables. Um, one was around, you know, making my bed in the morning and having a shower. That was something that I sort of said we're going to do and then fitting in exercise. And I committed to doing an hour's worth of exercise or well, not even an hour, just getting out for a walk every single day. Um, and again, when I say every single day, I, I did build in flexibility. So if things came up, then I would shift things. But generally speaking, at 10 a.m. on the next morning, I was out the door and it wasn't I didn't have rules around, you know, people say babies should sleep at a certain time. And I'm like, well, if it's his sleep time, he's going to be in the baby beyond and we're just going to go, or he's going to be in the pram and we're just going to go. It didn't, I didn't have to be at a place or a certain place or a certain time. I just went 10 a.m. That's what we're doing. That's how we're going to move our day. And so that was what I started with the very next day. Um, the other thing that I did and it's just slipped my mind, but it was, um, it'll come back to me. But yeah, it was just around creating some simple non-negotiables for me that would, I knew that would start to help move me forward was really important. Oh, the other thing that I started to do was just when, before I even opened my eyes in the morning, I would ask myself, do you feel happy? And the answer to that was no, but I would still get out of bed. Um, and it took two weeks 
for me, which again is, a, I think is quite a fast time frame to actually get a yes. And then perhaps the next day it was no again, but I kept asking myself that question and slowly over time, like I don't ask them, I don't ask myself that question anymore. Um, but it was just something that I needed to sort of pay attention and be aware of what was going on. And even though I got those no's, I still, you know, for me, it was still important to turn up and to, you know, do the things that I had to do, even though that I wasn't really physically or emotionally or spiritually even there. Um, I was just doing the things that I needed to do. Yeah. So you talk about um, that you didn't have, a, you didn't have a voice, right? That you hadn't found your voice. And so you were, you were listening to lies, basically. Um, talk to us about um, your thoughts on the importance of finding your voice and how, how that happened for you and then how we can apply that to others. Yeah. And I think we've touched on this a little bit already, but it's that whole, you know, when you have a baby, millions of women have done it around the world. So why isn't it a one size fits all? And it's not, um, every baby that is born is unique. You are unique. So, you need to find as a mother what works for you and what works for you doesn't necessarily mean that it works for the next person and as I'm a health coach so I know this now through dietary theories as well you know what I eat is not necessarily what you eat so why is it that we put this or have this story that it's a one-size-fits-all that we can you know everybody can do the same thing and we'll get the same outcome but the reality is there's a million ways to do the same thing <laughs> and to get the result that we want to do. So the putting yourself first, and uh, this can be really challenging for people because they see it as selfish, but actually putting yourself first and creating some self-love around that then expands the, the world around you. So that has a flow and effect for me to my son and to my husband and to my family that gives them permission um, to create more abundance in their own lives if they choose to do that. But the only way that you can do that is through voicing your opinion around or standing up and saying, no, this doesn't work for me. And like having that person walk in my front door and tell me that I was going to take my baby's life, like that was, it just became a non-negotiable for me. I wasn't willing to have those sorts of conversations with those sorts of people. Now that person is still in my life because of who they are in my life more broadly. Like, you know, there's some people that you can just let go of and there's some people that you can't. Um, and so I've had to manage that relationship differently, but it's, it's that whole putting boundaries around what you're willing to accept and what you're not willing to accept. And the only way you can do that is through voicing your opinion. And it's not about having a go at someone it's just saying enough this is how I need to this is how I need to show up this is what's working for me can we not celebrate that as women can we not go wow that's amazing I never thought to do it that way um, so you know showing showing people different ways to do things is also something to be celebrated but that finding your voice speaking your own voice it's, it sounds like that's so related to when you said knowing your, you know, having your intuition, knowing your intuition, following your intuition. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, I think I'm hearing that that's pretty interrelated, but tell us more about that, about how do you know, what is a, what is your intuition as a woman? How do you know? <laughs> tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. So intuition has been something that I've definitely played around with on my journey. Um, and it's trusting that inner voice. I didn't have a child because I thought it was a smart decision. You know, I said that I needed 10 hours worth of sleep. If I was, if I wanted that every day, there would be no children. Like that would be the smart decision. But my, prior to having Teddy, the whole premise of, of, of having him was my intuition, which speaks to me through my gut is this whole knowing that something is going to grow and be better. And so I would see my husband interact with my niece and that would just melt my heart. And I went, oh, this is so beautiful, but I'm not going to get 10 hours worth of sleep, but I kind of want that. And so having this narrative that I had for a few years around let's make a smart decision versus an emotional decision, and I don't mean from an outburst kind of perspective, but for me, that intuitive voice, listening to that voice never does me wrong. Like there's no way that I would be doing, I don't believe that there would be any way that I'd be doing the work in the world that I'm doing now if I never had Teddy because he absolutely opened up and cracked open my world that I 
you know, it just would never have happened um, or it wouldn't have happened to the depth of the work that I'm doing right now. So for people to start tuning into their intuition, just listening to how they make, you know, heart-centered decisions, that can be the first step in terms of figuring out how you listen to your intuition. For a lot of people, it is their gut, but for some people, it's a visual as well. They can actually see things and project things into the future and starting to trust and just play with it. Like I would play with it with traffic lights and go, okay, I want to, I want the traffic light to go green. Can we get, can we make it green? Like, and have that sort of conversation, like sounds stupid, but it was, it was really good. Um, or I would visualize myself across the road, walking past the traffic light. So the light had gone green, even though it was red, but I would visualize myself across the road. And so I would start to project out to what I want to create. And it was just playing around with those sorts of things, you know, picking an apple versus an orange, which one am I intuitively drawn to? Okay, I'm going to eat that one today. So you can play with the little things, which will then give you confidence and self-trust to be able to play with the bigger things. And I could have let that person continue to tell me that I was doing the wrong thing by my baby. And I could have continued to beat myself up on that. But at some point, I had to make a decision about my own health and well-being. And that wasn't supporting my health and well-being. So being able to then speak to them and say, this is, you know, intuitively, I knew this was wrong. So I'm going to tell you that what you're saying isn't appropriate and then move into the space of, that I can, which then helped me with that specialist where he's going to say, he, I'm going to be under the knife, <laughs> you know, I'll be knocked out while he's cutting me open again. And I, if I can't tell him that this is an inside out, so inside out job, like, when do I start to when do I start to use my voice? Otherwise, I start to hold that in, and it starts to manifest in other ways in my body, and that anxiety, the depression, um, and all the stress that I was going through played out through my son as well. So the fact that he was an hour on hour off sleeper, I don't think I look back and I kind of go, that's there's no there's no reason. Sorry, it is because I wasn't listening to myself. He is a reflection of me. And if I had have paid a little bit more attention, if I had have known myself a little bit better at that point, maybe we could have done things differently. But that comes through the lessons that you learn over time. Yeah. And, and that every kid, every experience, like you said, it's, it's different every time, yeah. you know? Yeah. So it's, it's, I think it's hard to look back and say, well, I, I mean, I think we do that anyway as moms. Well, if I had known then what I know now, yeah. but we didn't know what we didn't know. And so I don't know. I mean, there's something about being able to look back and like, I want to say, no, you did just right. <laughs> you know, like you did what you could and you were doing the best you could. And yeah. And like Steve Jobs talks about it. You can look back and see the dots that got you to where you are. Right. But you can't see that looking forward. Right. I can't project those dots out. And to me, the dots are the fear of walking forward. And part of the, you know, having Teddy, there was a lot of fear around that. Would it work? You know, we have to go through IVF. What are the impacts to me um, physically, you know, from, from taking all of those drugs? What are the impacts to him? What's going to happen going forward? I don't, I don't know what that journey is going to look like, but I know that it's going to make me grow. Like I knew that that was going to be a thing. So I went, okay, this is something that I need to do. Yeah. So beautiful. So my first child um, would nurse for 45 minutes every hour and a half. So I was also um, chronically sleep deprived. Um, and I was a child development specialist, right? I knew that there were different types of cries, but when it's your own child, right? And you're in the moment and you are sleep deprived and you have a child who is crying and you think it's hunger, then that's how you respond, right? And so that's what we did. Um, so I, I get, you know, and I, and I, of course, have my own postpartum depression story as well. Um, but I get how the sleep deprivation starts you on a path that can lead to a very dark place, yeah. right? I mean, sleep deprivation is a form of military torture. Yeah. Yes. Right. They use that for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's and I think that, so harsh. <laughs> right. And I think that as, as moms, 
Like if we don't recognize, hey, there's a physiological response to this lack of sleep that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we don't recognize that it's a physical issue that then is creating a mental health issue, then we start feeling guilt and shame and helplessness for sure. And that's, yeah. yeah. And we're not meant to raise babies by ourselves, but something within us is, or, and perhaps society is telling us that we need to be able to do this by ourselves, but that's not the reality. Like there are a million ways to, again, to, to raise a child, but having some support that is, that doesn't leave you feeling alone during that time um, is crucial to the success of mum's mental health and well-being and and physical health as well and then that has like I said before that has a flow-on effect to your child it has a flow-on effect to how they show up you know that you know, Teddy was an hour on hour off you know because potentially I didn't have enough milk like you know those sorts of things because I was stressed and I was strung out and here I am trying to produce milk and trying to feed myself and do all the things on top of you know, being sleep deprived. And there's so many women out there that are just struggling and you just kind of, you know, use the, the term or just get through, just push through. But what if we just stopped? And what if we said, okay, I can't do all of the things that need to be done because they're not important and I'm here to raise a child. That's my, you know, for 12 months, that's my key focus. And how can I do that, that it is in a way that is supportive for me? So perhaps bringing in a nighttime doula or bringing in um, other resources, having family members come and stay, all of that sort of stuff to be able to help with the times that you need help with. And then they can do all of the other things that you don't, you just don't need to focus on. Yeah. What would your advice be on how to ask for that help? Like what words do you, do you say so that you yeah. don't, Right. Because then there's the fear. They're going to think, I don't know what I'm doing. Then I might, they're going to take my children away. Right. I mean, it dominoes. <laughs> so what is a healthy way to say I need help? Yeah. So there's two things I'd say to that. One is around the time frame. So start asking for help now. Don't ask, don't wait till you're pregnant and having a baby. Start asking people for help in your life in areas that you, you need support with. Get in that cleaner if that's what you need to do. Um, ask that colleague, work colleague to do extra hours because you need support in a particular area. Start practicing asking because we don't ask already. Like we tend to take it on and just try and push through and get it done. So start that as a practice as early as possible. And if anybody on the podcast has children get them to start asking as well like it, it has to start at a younger age um, but then once you've had a baby and perhaps you haven't had that kind of practice just getting curious I think curiosity is the one thing that we can start to do that doesn't have judgment around it um, so getting curious and saying well what if I could do this differently what would that look like and who would be the people that then I would invite in because you don't want to invite just anybody into your circle you want to invite people in who will nourish you and who will support you so identifying who those people are and you're going to it's like dating you're going to bring in you know the first person and it might be your partner but for a mum I spoke to recently with her first um first child her partner went AWOL for like two years um and so he actually left the she had given birth and within two days he was gone because he was having some trouble um, from a PTSD perspective for other things that had come up for him but had then the the birth trauma had come to had brought all that out for him so with her second child she went right these are the these are the resources that I need and she went and locked them in she had a plan of course you've got to be flexible about that but she got that nighttime doula she got um, her mother to come in for a period of time so actually just taking that time to kind of identify who are the people that can really support you in this area and then starting to date and don't put judgment over it because the first person may not be the person that you need to, to bring in um, and they may not work out, but then, you know, just going from that curious perspective, maybe I can try this out and see what happens. Um, it gives you just more permission to, yeah, to let go of the judgment and, and have some fun in that space. Yeah. I'm sitting here thinking about it in the opposite perspective and, and that when I am asked for help. Okay. Because I think, 
I think I'm cautious. We're all as moms, we're, we're so cautious to ask for help. We yeah. don't want to ask for help because I'm a hassle. It's going to be hard. I don't want to be needy. You know, I'll be such a pain in the rear for this person, whatever. But then I think about the times that I have been asked and I'm so honored. I yeah. feel so oh, like I'm honored to come and pick you up and take you to that appointment or whatever. I'm, I'm, I feel so honored to be included. Mm. And, and you I want think, to bless people with, with help. Yeah. Right. I mean, how many times have you been asked for help and you thought, I don't want to help. I mean, it right. never happens. Well, that isn't right. That, that is not our instinct, right? Yeah. If someone, if someone we care about asks for our help, we're typically happy to help, mm-hmm. but, but then we have this problem asking for it ourselves. Right. And so I love that. I love the idea of, of just making it a habit mm-hmm. of recognizing when we need help in our lives yeah. and using our resources and, and just making those connections so that then it doesn't mm-hmm. feel so uncomfortable when we're desperate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Practicing like dating. That's so yeah. good. Cause yeah, yeah, my, my dearest friend moved away and I, to a different state and she was always my go-to. And so then I've, I've, I've been in this process of who do I call on now that's nearby? And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm really encouraged thinking, nope, you know what? I need to take the risk. I need to step out and start practicing that. Yeah. Good, good words. And I heard recently, and this was from a woman who had lost her, her husband suddenly, but the resources that came, because often people will bring food and same with a new mom, they will bring right. food. But potentially you could do a meal service rather than that. But what about a washing service? And for this woman, yeah. she had a friend who said, just leave your washing basket on the front step Tuesday, Thursday. I'll come and pick it up. I'll drop it back later that day. You don't have to think about it. And she was like, no, 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 I can't do that. She goes, no, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I expect it to be there. And so she would leave it out there. And for a year, this woman did her washing for her. Another gift that was given to her was, this was obviously in the bereavement space, but was a VA to do all of the things around changing over um, because everything that they had, it was in um, uh, the same account. So the same names that they had, you know, dual accounts for everything. So she had to change over everything. And this VA did all of that for her. So she didn't have to worry about ringing, you know, the telco company and saying, oh, my husband's died, but we need to change this over. So thinking about it from my perspective, I was running a company at the time. So I was doing all the payroll and I was doing um, all the bills and all of that sort of stuff on top of being a mum, a new mum. So, you know, potentially I could have got a bookkeeper or had somebody come in and do the bookkeeping for me. So I didn't have to worry about that aspect and it was kind of all done for me. So there's lots of things um, within somebody's life that you can actually help and support with beyond food, I think is, you know, is my point. And just for our listeners, VA is virtual assistant. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't have to be virtual, but this happened to be a virtual one. So there can be people sure. in the local. Well, that's area, but... convenient because yeah. there's a larger pool of them to choose yeah. from if you're going yes. online. Well, this is the perfect segue to kind of the next thing uh, we wanted to ask you about. And that's um, your philosophy about why it's important. Why does it matter so much to, to learn how to put yourself first? So yes. tell us more about that. Yeah. So self-love was a cornerstone to everything that I started to do. And I realized that from an like from early on that I really just needed to focus on the things that lit me up because when they did, then there was a flow and effect. And I said to my husband at one point, you know, like if I'm happy, you're going to be happy. Like the family, the house is going to be happy. There's just going to be more energy going on. And it's that analogy. If you're giving from an empty cup, you've got nothing to give. So, and there's nothing coming back from you. Whereas if that cup is overflowing, you're giving from the overflow and you have so much more to give to everybody around you. Um, So it's, yeah, it's that analogy. And Matthew McConaughey talks about it as well, to be selfish, to be selfless. So knowing that when you prioritize yourself, when you come back into the things that light you up, that creates energy in your own life. And that then has a flow and effect to everybody around you. You know, like my husband kind of 
this year he was talking about it on um, on a podcast or a seminar that I was doing. He jumped on and I had shared my story and he was just sprouting off about how proud he is of everything that I've achieved and everything that I've done. And, you know, you look back at the story, I could have stayed in that black hole. That's That was always an option. I could have stayed right there and I could have been the victim and hated my life. But to then kind of go to him, which is what I said to him was, I love you, but it's time to listen to me now. And so to then start to tune into my intuition, create those self-love, um, create the self-love boundaries, create my soul hour, which is something that I did as well. You know, that just that first hour of the day, which didn't always happen as a mum, but was the first hour of the day that was just for me to kind of figure out who I was, what I what lit me up and just learn to identify with who I am now and who, who do I want to be effectively. And so once you get to know yourself and the only way that you can do that is by those self-love tools. So bringing in the things that light you up is, is just going to create more abundance in your life. So if I leave everybody with nothing else today, it's just the importance of doing you and doing you from an authentic place and a loving place. Um, it's just so powerful for yourself and for everybody around you. That feels so hard. That feels so hard because as I think as, as wives, as moms, it feels selfish. It feels yeah. like if I'm going to put myself first, I'm just being selfish. And the people around me are going to think, oh, well, don't you need your hour to yourself? Uh-huh. Poor little baby. I mean, I th the self-talk, right? The bad, yeah. the inner critic, all that. I mean, dang, yeah. how do you, I, I hear what you're saying in theory. And yet I'm thinking in practicality, how do I, as a mom and a wife, not feel like that's just selfish? Yeah, but tell me, like, if you don't give yourself that time, how do you show up? Do you show up from a place of, oh, this is amazing, life is good? Or are you like, oh, my gosh, I'm just shoveling shit and I'm continuing to shovel shit? Do you know what I mean? Right. And, right. Yeah. And so I, the argument with my husband, because it did get to a point where he's going, you're doing too much of it. Like, seriously, you've got to slow down or you've got to stop at some point. And I said, but... yeah okay, we can find a compromise in this because I was sort of, I was, you know, actively doing my soul hour every day and we took a few days off and that sort of stuff to rebuild my relationship with him. But I said, I am a better person for it. So if I am a better person for it, that means you're going to be a better person. We're going to have a better relationship because otherwise I just don't want to turn up. I don't want to have sex with you. Like seriously, I haven't connected with you. I don't want to go out to dinner with you. Oh, we're going to the movies again. Great. That's just something that I really want to do when, you know, I, I just don't know who I am and I don't know what I want. So I get where you're coming from. And a lot of people say that to me about, yeah. you know, it's just selfish. I, you know, my kids come first. I'm like, at some point you've got to come first because it's the oxygen mask. You <laughs> If you don't put it on yourself first, yeah, yeah, the rest of the people in your family are going to have no chance at survival because you can't function. And so giving yourself that gift, even if it is just sitting, taking a breath in and a breath out, and that's it. And you do that consciously. That's, ex that's where it can start. It doesn't have to be an hour a day. And some days Teddy would come into my bed and I was just about to get up for my soul hour. And I just knew he wouldn't go back to sleep. So my soul hour was in bed with him and that was okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I mean, if the batteries die, you know, in your toy, that toy doesn't work anymore. It's completely oh. useless unless you yeah. recharge the batteries. Yeah. And so if you think about self-care and self-love as just recharging your batteries so that then you have something useful yeah. to give yeah. back. Yeah. So good. I think this is a big, big, big challenge for us. Moms, <laughs> listeners, are, you, are we hearing this? Are you hearing this challenge? take the time, carve it out, try to, try to reframe it mentally as not selfish, but as self-care so that then you have the ability to care for others. Yeah. yeah. The time is there and it's not about running away from your life. It's about incorporating it within your life. So knowing what your intention is, often we will go and get our hair done or nails done. And just because I need to get out of the house for, you know, an hour and I'm running away from my family, 
what if you took your kids with you because you've got a daughter who would love to go and get her nails done and you had a great time with her? That can be self-love as well. It doesn't have to be singular. It doesn't have to be on your own. So getting out there and incorporating it. And that's what happens when you start to do this work on yourself. That's the flow on effect that happens. Um, and yeah, so like just making sure that you can just take that time a little bit for yourself, but then look at that bloom, look at that grow, because you don't want your children to be running around like you are running around, exhausted, unhappy in your life, unfulfilled, all of that sort of stuff and going, oh, this is good enough. What if it could be better? Because it can be better. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so we need to take a quick break and Terry's going to read a word from our sponsor and then when we come back, I want to talk about your idea that going on your journey is about who you're becoming and not who you think you should be. Yeah, sure. Is your child struggling in more than one subject in school? Have you tried tutoring but still aren't seeing the improvements you were hoping for? Most learning challenges aren't caused by a lack of instruction. They're typically caused by cognitive skills that just aren't strong enough. Skills like auditory processing, memory, reasoning, attention, and processing speed. Learning RX one-on-one brain training programs are designed to target and strengthen the skills that we rely on for thinking and learning in every subject. Learning RX can help you identify which skills may be keeping your child from performing their best. In fact, they've worked with more than 100,000 children and adults who wanted to think and perform better. They'd like to help get your child on the path to a brighter and more confident future. Give Learning RX a call at 866 Brain01 or visit learningrx.com. That's learningrx.com. And we're talking to Susan Scullin about postpartum depression and getting your life back and your happiness back after that. And so I mentioned that um, I was really intrigued by your idea that going on your journey is about who you're becoming and not who you think you should be. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, I can look back on my journey and I can tell you the markers, you know, like I can tell you about the mastitis, I can tell you about the sleepless nights, I can tell you about the surgery. But that doesn't tell you who I became on the journey. They're just, they're just points in the sand. So this year, my intuition was telling me that I needed to explore who I had actually become on the journey and start to tell that kind of story. And, you know, there's a certain amount of resilience that comes in any kind of journey that you go on. There's a leadership for me, leadership has been really strong. And, and, you know, we've talked about finding your own voice, but knowing no matter what journey that you go on, what are the lessons that you learn through that space? It's not about, oh, I've ticked a box. It's actually who I've become. Does that make it clear? Yes. That's sort of the process that I'm thinking about. Yeah. So that's what's sort of playing around with me at the moment. Um, clearly, it's still a little bit undeveloped, but um, it's just encouraging people to think about things more more broadly rather than like I said ticking a box and go okay well you know I consider myself now recovered from postnatal depression I'm not saying that depression will never come back into my life or that there are never sort of you know relapses and that sort of thing but I don't I don't identify with it as you know, identify it with as, as something that happened but not some someone that I am and so now thinking about who I have become if I was to articulate that I am much stronger in um in what I want and, and how I want those things to play out in life. Um, I'm stronger about, you know, my conviction around what I want to create. I'm stronger in the person that I am um, and authenticity, you know, love turning up for myself. You know, I embody those on a daily basis as opposed to the being things that I talk about and perhaps not doing. And so putting myself out in the world, like having this conversation with you ladies today, that can be really challenging for a lot of people. But to me, that speaks to the importance of the message and sharing with people that it is possible to be, you know, go through these things and come out the other side of it. And for me, I didn't get a diagnosis and I didn't take medic medication. And that's okay if people choose to go down those sorts of paths. I'm not saying that it's not, but 
that then spoke to me about, well, clearly I am strong. There's a strength within me. And I think that every woman, every person on the, on the planet has that strength that may just be underdeveloped, but there is a strength in there. And that has really cultivated through this journey that I've had um, to the point that now I'm, I know when I say yes and no to things, whether I'm meant to be there or not meant to be there. And I couldn't have told you that I could do that, you know, six years ago. Um, there were certain challenges that I would have faced along that way, along that journey. So, yeah, encouraging people to look at whatever they do <clears throat> on their path, whether it be through a work project that they're rolling out or whether it be um, through just, you know, not just being a bum, but being a mum and seeing the things that your, your children are bringing, you know, bringing to the world, well, they're actually helping you grow too. So who have you become on that journey? Don't just tick the box because it's another year and they're celebrating their birthday. You've actually grown through that year and what are the, what are the things that you've, you know, who have you become across that, you know, during that time? Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. Cause I think we're, it's like having multiple children. I mean, the mom you are with your first kid, you're a different person by, yes. you know, a year later, two years later, three years later, whatever. You're a different mom. You're a different person when that different kid comes along and things are constantly changing and growing. And um, I think it's, it's good. You, I like, I appreciate that you touched on um, it is important for some people. It is needed to look to medication, to look to, um, help with a, a psychologist or psychiatrist um, that postpartum depression can is, is on a spectrum in a sense that can have many, many different degrees and levels. And Amy, you can speak to that a little bit more, but I, I want our listeners to hear that too, that, that there are times when you do need to um, call on help from professionals. Yeah. And, and not being afraid to do that. Like it comes back to asking for help. Um, just, you know, come back to that dating. There's nothing wrong here. I'm just feeling out, you know, feeling out of my depth or something's just not feeling, you know, in myself that I am myself and going to talk to that health professional. You know, if I knew that health coaches existed back when I had my postnatal depression, perhaps that would have been the route that I took. Um, I didn't want to go back into a medical route because I uh, Clearly, I wasn't having a great, I was dealing with some of those people, but I wasn't having a great experience in that space. So it just didn't reson resonate with me. Mm -hmm. um, so finding what works with you and coming back into that whole dating spectrum of going, I'm just trying this on for size. And back to the talk, you know, in terms of medication, sometimes that will help you get from point A to point B. And that's what you need in that time. And that's completely fine. Do what works for you, I think is, you know, the message that I would like to put out there. So you mentioned if you had known about a health coach, um, let's talk about what you do as a coach. Like, tell us about your program. Yeah, so I work with women uh, to find the fun in health and life beyond postnatal depression. Um, I certainly see that there's an opportunity to move upstream around let's not even get into depression. Like let's have the tools beforehand so that we can work through everything that's going on. But yeah, I work with women in a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, programs are coming, but just talking through the challenges that they're facing, talking through the, using the mindset tools to be able to see how our thoughts create our results. I think that's something really critical that, you know, everybody needs to know is that the thoughts that we have, and um, women have around 70,000 thoughts a day. So no wonder we're just on this, you know, constantly going, going, going with our brain. Men have around 50,000. So that's why they're a lot slower, just for, <laughs> if you've ever noticed that. <laughs> Um, but if we can start to have a look at some of the thoughts that we're playing on repeat and then come back into, well, what do I want to think on purpose and start playing around with that and knowing that our thoughts connect to our feelings. So some people will feel feelings first and then they go, oh, these things, these feelings are just happening, happening to me. And that's not the truth. You've actually got a thought about something that's, that's creating that. So sitting and working with my clients around that, often people come into me because I'm a health coach. I'm also a life coach, but often they'll come into me from a food perspective. So we'll work through food, but how you do one thing is how you do everything. So that has a flow and effect from into your relationships, into your career, into physical activity and into your spiritual practice, whatever that might look for look like for you. And as health coaches, we work, we predominantly work on that primary food. So primary food is that career relationship, spirituality and physical activity, because when they're in balance, 
everything that happens on your plate is secondary. So, you know, whilst people will come into come in to me from the outside perspective, so looking at their plate and their food, we naturally eventually end up into the what's going on in your career. Perhaps you're eating because you're not really happy in that space or perhaps you're eating because or you're drinking because you're not happy in your relationship and starting to create this space where, again, they're coming back into their own intuition and they're starting to trust themselves and build that self-efficacy so that they can make decisions um, and start to grow and experiment in a safe sort of in a safe environment with me. And then that starts to naturally have a flow on effect into the rest of their life as well. Tell us about your uh, internet, your special offer, not internet offer, your special offer that you've got going right now. Yeah, so um, that would be like a free session with me. Is that right? Is that what we're doing? So (laughs) (laughs) I'm happy. Yeah, I'd love to offer everybody um, who is listening on the call today. So what I'm I'm actually going to extend it for you. So it would be just like a 15-minute connection call. So just reach out to me um, at hello at Susan Scollin, S-C-O-L-L-E-N.com, a 15-minute connection call. And if they are a right fit. If you think that I'm a right fit for you and you're a right fit for me, uh, we will then go into a one hour uh, call. We'll book that in and work through your wellness plan. Have a look at what you're creating now. What do you want to create? Have a look at the gap and then set you up with a plan to start moving forward. Now, whether you stay and work with me on that, that's fine. Um, that would be amazing. But you may feel like you've got enough information out of that one session just to start making some small changes in your life and start moving forward. Okay. And so who would be the ideal client for that? Who, who should call you? Yeah. So typically for that, I, you know, it's those mums that are ready to make that move. So they may not have had postnatal depression, but they've just kind of struggled with, you know, the change of becoming a mum. Um, and they're ready to make a move forward. Like they can see some space in their calendar. They've um, just got some space in their day effectively, and they've got some space in their mind to start making some small shifts and changes. So it's that mum that's ready to start making those shifts. Okay. Yeah. I would say this that's is wonderful. a big gift. People, listeners, this is a huge gift. If this is something you could ta- you could take advantage of, folks, I think this this could sometimes it's a it's a catalyst like this that can just start turning the ship of frustration and discontent and problems in your life and so yeah let's do it if you're struggling with things if you are feeling depressed or lost or where do i go next as a new mom or even as your kids are transitioning into different ages um yeah take advantage of, of this tell us again what do they need to email just say it one more time so our listeners hear this yeah, so it's a hello, H-E-L-L-O, at Susan Scollin, S-U-S-A-N-S-C-O-L-L-E-N.com. Okay. And just come and date me. That's yes. all you're doing. Let's experiment. <laughs> come and, come and date you. Yeah. I love that. Nice. Okay. So we are out of time and do need to wrap up, but this has been a really important conversation mm-hmm. um, that we've had. And we so appreciate you, Susan, for sharing your personal story with us. Yeah and your insights um, on this topic that is just so much more widespread than new moms and moms want to talk about. And so um, we appreciate your vulnerability and and coming in and and bringing some awareness to that. Um, So again, if you want to learn more about Susan and her work, you can visit her website at susanscullen.com. We will put her email address, her website, and her social media handles in the show notes. Um, as a mental health professional, I do want to say that today's episode is not a substitute for medical advice. If you are suffering from postpartum depression, please ask for help. You can talk to your doctor or visit Postpartum Support International at postpartum.net, where you can find online support groups, telephone support, and lots of other resources to help you as well. So thanks so much for listening today. If you like our show, we would love it if you would leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd rather watch us, we are on YouTube and you can follow us on social media at The Brainy Moms. So until next time, look, we know you're busy moms and we're busy moms. So we are out. See ya. Thank you.